I'm happy to welcome all of you for this webinar on financial analysis must skill for every banking executive. I also wish to title this webinar as how to analyze financial condition of business without going through years of mainstream finance education. We are now living in the world of online education. COVID lockdown has opened up the possibilities for online learning. In the past several months, you would have attended various webinars, various workshops, online programs. You would have attended your own organizational internal training. But despite all this, if you have registered for this webinar, if you are attending this webinar, it means you are seriously looking for some guidance. You are seriously looking for some learning resources. I can give you that assurance. That is, your next 60 plus minutes is going to be the valuable time. You will have lots and lots of takeaway in this next 60 plus minutes. What you require is guidance from right person. I can give you enough guidance. I can act as a resource person for you. That's the assurance from my side. Okay, so what is the objective of this program? What is my goal? My goal is basically to help out two types of executives, bank executives and finance executives. They should learn financial analysis. Bankers, they should learn financial analysis because when they sanction loan to a borrower, they do credit appraisal, credit analysis. And in that financial analysis is the core. So bank executives, especially credit analysts, credit managers, relationship manager, branch manager, credit risk creator, sales manager, they should have a good knowledge of credit and financial analysis. Similarly, finance executives, they should understand how banks are going to evaluate their business. They should understand what are the expectations of the lenders so that they can equip the financial position of their business as well. So that's my goal here, twin objectives. One is to help bank executives. The other one is to help finance executives. So shall we begin? Are you ready? If you are ready, type start. If you are ready, type start. Thank you very much. Let's go through a small story. Over a period of five to six years, I was training uh, thousands of bank executives on topics like credit analysis, financial analysis, working capital, term loan. This is happening for the past five to six years. But all this did not happen just like that because I need some foundation, right? How I am teaching this from where I have learned all this. Let's go back to 2008. In 2008, I joined SBI as credit analyst immediately after my chartered accountancy qualification. I used to say it's just one day before completing my CA program. In campus interview, I was selected. So I had this tag, CAN Raja, BCom, PGDB, FCA, Chartered Accountant. And I had that bit of headweight also because uh, completed CA in first attempt, got job in SBI, that to joining as credit analyst. Wow. Okay. So I joined SBI and first three to four months that gave me a literal nightmare. Because the profile of credit analyst, credit analysis was not as simple as what I thought. Because in CA final and all, we have done extensive, complicated uh, study analysis, everything. But when I faced that reality, it shocked me. Day in and day out, we'll be getting balance sheets of corporate customers, business entities. You have to read the balance sheet. You have to analyze. You have to read line by line items. You have to read in between lines. You have to arrive at ratios. You have to analyze, interpret them, then see their cash flow statement, fund flow statement, then uh, do the credit risk rating, then put up a appraisal, then attend committee meetings, get firing, answer the questions. And in the meantime, three to four other proposals will be in queue again. You have to analyze different set of customers absolutely with the different business models. So first three to four months was absolute nightmare. Despite being a chartered accountant, I faced lots and lots of difficulty in understanding what this credit analysis and financial analysis is all about. But thank God, 
I had good mentors in SBI. They guided me. With their guidance, I was able to pick up things very fast, very fast. And within a period of one year, I got elevated as team leader of credit processing cell. And over a period of four years in SBI, I worked on 250 plus projects. It's 5,000 crore plus size. But what I came across is, despite being a chartered accountant, I, saw, I struggled a lot. And when I was elevated as team leader, I had a newcomers reporting to me who are basically from non-finance background, engineers, science graduates. They struggle in understanding basic accounting. Then comes balance sheet, then comes financial analysis. They had so much of difficulties. So at the time, they used to ask me to teach on basic things. So in the evening time, I used to teach them what is accounting, what is balance sheet, what are ratios, cash flows, fund flows. It started then. It started in 2008 onwards, I can say. And this journey continued for a period of four years. Then I came out, I got into CA practice. I had my practice for a period of seven and a half years with more focus on project funding, debt syndication. So again, what I witnessed is whenever I go to bank, whenever I represent a client, the bankers on the other side were found to be on the weaker position because client has good knowledge of his business, but bank executive, they are basically shifted from some other department and they have very little idea about what this financial analysis is all about. And many times they fumble. I've seen this. So I started training bankers on credit and financial analysis areas so that they can approach or they can face their customers very confidently. I started teaching through bank internal training programs. I also empaneled myself as trainer with a few banks. Then I explored technology. Thanks to technology, today I teach 2 lakh plus students of which 1 lakh 91,000 plus students are from Udemy portal and 35,000 plus students are from my own portal, CA Raja classes. Our YouTube channel crossed 1 lakh plus subscribers and my teaching journey was also featured in New Indian Express. I also received Indian Achievers Award 2021 from Indian Achievers Forum for contribution in nation building through teaching. So in this backdrop, I wish to ask you once again, are you really serious about learning financial analysis? Are you really serious about learning financial analysis? If yes, if yes, please type this ISAFA. I am serious about financial analysis. Just type ISAFA. I'll keep asking you to type out some small, small things like this. It's basically to ensure we are connected. For me, it happens now and then. Without any notice, my internet connection will go. Okay, so that can happen even today also. So if at all that happens, I would request you to stay back for another five to 10 minutes. In the meantime, I can make some other alternate arrangements. Okay, so if you are serious about learning financial analysis today, type ISAFA. Let's get started with today's presentation. Financial analysis must kill for every banking executive. As a bank executive, why you have to understand financial analysis? Remember one thing, what is the core business of banking? The core business is lending and how bank takes that decision. They take that lending decision by carrying out something known as credit analysis. And in that financial analysis plays a very, very significant role. So if you want to rise up in your organizational hierarchy in bank, you should know what is the core business of banking and you should be in a position to take that decision as well. So for that, you have to understand the elements, the factors related to that and in that financial analysis is very, very important. Financial analysis of whom? Financial analysis of borrowers. Because when they come to the bank approach for a loan, the bank should be in a position to evaluate the customer then take a decision and they can do that partly by carrying out financial analysis. And when I say financial analysis, it is analyzing their financial statements 
the audited or the past financials and also their estimated projected financials and for carrying out that analysis we are going to use three critical tools one is financial ratio analysis two is cash flow analysis and three is fund flow analysis let's get started with financial ratio analysis i'm going to take you through an example let's say there is company a and company b company a has reported a profit of 10 crore and company b has reported a profit of 5 crore if i ask you which company had performed well at this point what will be your answer it's a simple question. It's like taking a baby step, but still I want all of you to participate. Some of you may even feel information is inadequate to take a decision, but let's take that baby step. Let's take that baby step. Uh, you have to say which company is performing better. Yes, I could see answers coming. Answers coming like uh, most of you are saying yes, yay, yay, yay. Uh, so I could see more of yay. And uh, very few said uh, can't take a decision now. And uh, so the conclusion, I'm going to make it like this. Majority said A and very few said they need some more information. Okay, let's see in what direction this goes. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Most of you would say company A, right? Because company A has reported a profit of 10 crore. But if I supply you one piece of information, that is the sales achieved by this company. Company A has achieved a sales of 100 crore and company B has achieved a sales of 25 crore. And if I ask you once again, which company has performed well now, what will be your answer? Yeah, earlier at least some of you would have felt that or you have expressed also that information is inadequate to take a decision and I'm literally forcing you to take a decision. So now this time I have supplied something important and relevant information. And remember earlier, majority of you said A. Majority of you said it's company A that is performing better. Now let's look at the kind of shift that is going to happen. And I know it's a very elementary question. This is not rocket science. I'm not teaching you something hi-fi here. I'm not teaching you the advanced concepts in financial analysis. We are just taking our baby step but you are going to see the kind of impact financial analysis can have on your decision. That's what I'm trying to bring out here. And I could see answers coming like, uh, so what I could see is now majority of the answers are coming in favor of B. I think it's a drastic shift. Majority of you are saying B, why this happened? Why this happened? See, earlier you took a decision based on raw data. That's why majority selected A. But when I supplied you that additional piece of information, that critical and logical information, which you can relate with, you did that analysis. I believe you did that meaningful analysis and I believe you have taken a quality decision. How many of you agree with me that you have taken a quality decision now? Because earlier you chose A, but now you have selected B. And how many of you believe that B is actually performing better? If you believe yes, please type yes. And if you changed your opinion, please type me. It means you have changed your opinion. It's a confession. Do that confession. It's good because you are learning now. Okay. See, even now there are many other factors. We cannot take a decision just by looking at the profit alone. Okay. There are many other factors, but let us take our baby step. We'll take up our step one, step two, then we'll go deeper and deeper. But given this information, now we can conclude that B is actually performing better than A. Earlier, majority of you said A, but many of you could change your decision. It means now you have taken an informed decision. Earlier decision was taken on the basis of raw data, but now it is analytical information and you have taken a quality decision and that's the power of financial analysis. And that's why I maintain financial analysis as the core. So once again, with this note, I welcome all of you for joining this webinar and let's get into the world of financial analysis. And this is the way in which we are going to learn today. And if you find this way of learning interesting, please type cool, C-O-O-L. Or if you find it super cool, you are welcome to type super cool as well. But let me admit, it's not rocket science. These are all simple concepts. I just got the privilege of introducing them to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for all those cool, super cool comments. Let's get into the discussion. There will be a drastic shift, right? 
because earlier most of you would have favored company A but now majority of you will be favoring company B. What happened? When you looked at the standalone figure it was deceiving because profit of 10 crore looked better than profit of 5 crore. Yes, that's true. But when you gone deeper by comparing the profit with sales, you were able to calculate the profit margin. Company A has reported a profit of 10 crore on 100 crore. It means they have a profit margin of 10%. Whereas company B has reported a profit of 5 crore on 25 crore. It means they have profit margin of 20%. So what's happening? Company B has performed well. In this case, what we have done is we have compared the profit with sales and we have calculated this ratio. Profit by sales into 100. That is what we have calculated as profitability or profit margin. Okay. So ratios are basically a relationship between two numbers which are created in a logical way. Yes, we related sales and profits and it's a relationship between two numbers and there was a logic in relating the sales and profit because we can measure profitability. We related current assets and current liability to numbers and the logic is it helps us to understand the liquidity. Okay, so ratios are relationship between two numbers which are created in a logical way and it will help us to understand the past, present and future performance and it will also help us to understand the strengths and weaknesses of businesses. Yes, by looking at the profitability ratio, we were able to understand like which company is performing well. So we have understood the strength and weakness. So like that we can give many variations. Okay, so that's about ratios and we are going to understand the ratios by looking at its classifications. Ratios are broadly classified into four categories. They are liquidity ratios, capital structure or leverage ratios, activity ratios and profitability ratios. First, let's get started with liquidity ratios. Liquidity is basically ability of the business to meet its short term expenses, short term obligations without difficulty. At this point, I just want to bring the balance sheet here. So those who don't know what is balance sheet, balance sheet is a simple statement which will show from where and all money had come for business and where and all that money had been used. Okay, so for business money can come from owners, we call it as equity, money can come from outsiders, we call it as liabilities. When money comes from outsiders, it can come with an obligation to pay within one year or pay after one year. If it comes with an obligation to pay within one year, we call them as short term liabilities because we have to pay within one year and using these money which are basically raised as repayable within one year, which we call them as short term liability. We can use this liability money to create asset that is short term asset. But if you look at this, the short term assets are greater than short term liability. How it is possible? Because the short term what is raised in yellow box is smaller, but short term assets are larger. It means this short term assets could not have been created without the support of some long term funds because only a portion of short term assets are funded by short term liabilities. It means there got to be some remaining funds which have been used in creating short term assets and that's how it should be for every business. Short term assets should be greater than short term liabilities because short term liabilities are those liabilities which you have to repay within one year and for repaying that you need resources. Resources will be in the form of short term assets. So the resources should always be greater than the obligation. That's why I've, I've captured the short term assets as larger size and short term liabilities as smaller size. That's how it should be for an ideal business. Okay, right. Now, to understand this liquidity concept, let's first digest this fund utilization principle. Yes, whatever you see on screen, I mean it. This fund utilization principle is going to be the very, very important segment of this webinar. I would call this segment as the savior for banking system. Entrepreneurs, employees, everyone, such a powerful principle 
do not miss even a single point if you don't have your notepad and pen please go and grab it because it's such a such a powerful principle which you will agree for after the end of this explanation okay so let's continue whoever attending this webinar whether you work in a bank or whether you are an entrepreneur or a finance manager or a chartered accountant or a cost accountant okay please take this principle to your heart to your mind and try to teach this to as many entrepreneurs as possible because several businesses fail because of not understanding this principle okay now listen i said money for business can be raised from the owners we call it as equity it can be raised from outsiders we call it as liabilities and this liability can be short term liability and these short term liability can be used for creating assets they are called as short term assets but here if you look at short term assets are greater than short term liabilities it means a portion a some portion of short term assets are funded by long term funds i call them as long term liabilities and equity so this gives rise to the understanding that equity the money contributed by the owner is always long term and other long term liabilities liabilities means repayable so it can be a term loan it can be a debenture okay right so if you look at the composition here short term assets are created using a portion using a entire portion of short term liabilities and some portion of long term funds i call it so you still have some more long term funds which can be used for creating long term assets now comes the fund utilization principle if you are raising short term funds you can use it for creating short term assets it is good if you are raising long term funds you can use it for creating long term assets that is also good if you are raising long term funds you can use a portion of long term funds for creating short term assets that is considered as ideal but one thing that should never ever happen in any business is never ever use short term funds for creating long term assets never ever use short term funds for creating long term assets why do i say that short term funds are raised with a promise that you will repay within one year and if you want to repay within one year you should have invested that money in short term assets because only those assets can be converted into cash within a period of one year so that you can use that cash to pay back the short term liability on the other side if you use the short term liability on creating long term assets by very name by very nature they are long term assets it means those are all the assets which cannot be converted into cash within a period of one year so you borrowed with a promise you will repay within one year so when the due date approach if you look back you will not have short term assets what you will have is only long term assets long term assets by very nature by very definition they cannot be converted into cash within a period of one year then you will carry sorry figure or you will carry sorry face with your lender imagine that short term liability that short term fund was given by a banker in the form of a cash credit or overdraft and when they demands the repayment and if you don't have a matching short term assets because you have already used that money in long term assets what's your position you will not be able to sell that long term asset but this lender the banker who gave you that cash credit who gave you that overdraft will hardly wait you wait for 90 days 90th day they will classify the account as non performing asset and they will go for legal recovery measures and that becomes the beginning of end of a business okay so understand diverting the short term funds for long term purpose is suicidal most of the business they do not realize this they think all money are same but short term money have very high pressure because they have to be settled in the short term period but long term money they are cool because you have to settle them over a period of time only just imagine you take a home loan you have to pay over a period of 20 years your obligation will also be manageable but for that entire home loan amount if you go and take an overdraft imagine the kind of pressure will you be able to settle that entire home loan amount within a period of one year it will not happen right 
So if at all you raise an overdraft equivalent to home loan amount and if you put that in constructing a house, it means you are not constructing a house, you are constructing something else which I don't want to mention because it's going to put you in trouble, it will give you sleepless nights. Okay, so never ever do this. Let me give some numbers so that we can understand it better. I've raised a short term funds of 100 million and I've used to use that funds to create short term assets of 70 million only. So here comes the problem. I've raised the short term funds of 100 million, but the short term assets what I have created out of it is only 70 million. So the question is what happened to that remaining 30 million and the answer is very obvious. It is not in short term assets. They are in long term assets. They are in long term assets. So what I've done here, I've diverted the short term funds of 30 million for long term assets. And I've also raised some long term funds of 70 million which I've used for creating long term assets of 70 million. So my total both sides are 170 million. But here what happened is I've raised 100 million of which I have spent only 70 million for short term purpose. Then I did that blunder unpardonable mistake of diverting the short term funds for long term purpose 30 million. This is going to put this business in serious trouble because the lender whoever have given that 30 million they will come and ask for the payment within period of one year and for paying them I don't have short term assets because the existing short term assets is only 70 million for that there is a corresponding obligation of 70 million whereas for the remaining obligation of 30 million I don't have short term assets what I have is only long term assets the long term assets I cannot sell just like that it will take its own time and those lenders will not wait till I settle my long term assets or till I sell my long term assets. Okay, that's where the problem starts because bankers are permitted to wait only for 90 days. Then they have to go for legal enforcement. If it is a supplier's money, probably he'll give you two or three calls, then he'll go for legal enforcement. That's where the problem starts. Okay, so here there is a diversion of 30 million and the 70 million they have used for a long term purpose only that's okay but the blender the mistake the sin what was committed here is diversion of 30 million short term funds for long term purpose okay it's this principle which was not taught to entrepreneurs not understood by entrepreneurs and because of that several business lands into trouble business runs into trouble because entrepreneurs were not taught about this they are not cautioned about this had this principle been instilled on their minds that committing this is a mistake, this will put them in trouble, we could have saved several thousands of business. But by the time entrepreneurs realize that they have committed this mistake, they will be in deep trap. Then they try to come out of it, but chances of coming out of it is very, very remote unless and until they line up some long-term funds to substitute this immediately. In my opinion, it's a powerful principle, but given very less weightage and because of that, businesses are collapsing and this is even shaking the banking system. So I call it a powerful principle and I have a question for you. How do you find this principle? Do you find this principle useful? If you find this principle useful, please type useful. Or if you find this principle super powerful, please type super powerful. Because it's such a powerful principle but not given due weightage. Even Reserve Bank conducted a study to understand why business units are becoming sick, why they are becoming non-performing assets. And do you know what was the reason they identified? They identified that only 5% of businesses are failing because of poor sales, high competition, technology non-upgradation, quality matters, HR issues, legal issues, and those is only 5%. It means remaining 95% of the businesses have failed only because of the single reason called diversion of short term funds for long term purpose. So understand this principle. And if you find this principle useful, if you find this principle super powerful, shall I place a request with you? It's a request where you have to act on. If you're permitting me, please type yes. Please type yes, because it's a request and you have to act on the request. Yeah, thank you so much. The request is you just have to take this message forward. Meaning you have to teach this principle.
Please teach this principle to the entrepreneurs you know. Please teach this principle to your friends and colleagues who are connected in banking and finance. Take that two or three minutes just to teach them. Take it from me. It will create a wave kind of impact. It can safeguard several businesses. Not only businesses, it's a dependence like employees, bankers, various stakeholders, everyone, such a powerful principle. So my question to you is, will you teach? Will you teach? If yes, please type, I will teach. Please type, I will teach. Or simply type IWT. Simply type IWD. Everyone can be saved if they can appreciate the crux of this principle. And when you teach, please place the same request. Ask them to teach it to someone they know. In this way, let this message reach masses. Because this is a kind of a virus and it happens mostly on account of ignorance. And people will realize only after committing this mistake. And this is not only applicable for business, but also for our own personal life. And yes, I could see many of you taking that oath. Please see to that you teach at least one person in the following week. And thank you. Let's continue with the discussion. With this understanding, let's get into liquidity ratios. Liquidity ratios are broadly classified into four ratios. And in this webinar, we are going to focus on the first one that's very important. That is current ratio. So current ratio scenario should look like this because we know how to calculate current ratio, which is current asset by current liability. Okay, but uh, current ratio scenario should be like this. That is current assets should be greater than current liabilities. And we calculate the current ratio like this current asset by current liability. If current assets are greater than current liability, it means the resources are greater than obligations. Okay, let me take you through three scenarios. Look at the scenario one where the current liabilities are given. Okay, so this is total current liability, which is 300 and the resources that are available to settle that obligation is available. Okay, so the obligation is 300, resources are 600. So I think here the liquidity position is really comfortable. If I plot this in a form of a graph, the red bar indicates the resources, blue bar is the obligation. And here you can see there is a comfort zone. We call that as positive networking capital. How I have calculated? I have compared the current assets with current liabilities. So there are excess current assets. Excess current assets means that portion of current asset is not created by current liability, but they are rather funded by long term funds. The portion of long term funds used for creating current asset, we technically call it as networking capital. So if a business is having positive networking capital, it is a good sign because to that extent, that business will not have liquidity pressure. Okay, here they have 600 million as current assets and 300 million is the current liability. So they have pressure only for 300 million. For the remaining 300 million, they don't have pressure because it can be settled over a period of long time. Okay, that's what we understand when current ratio is like this, like 2 is to 1. Let me give you another scenario. Here the current liabilities is same and current assets, there is a difference. Okay, look what's happening. Current liabilities are 300 and current assets were also 300. So you have an obligation of 300 million for that. You have resources of 300 million. It looks like uh, a perfect scenario, but that's not the case. Okay, because uh, let's say the bank CC has become due. This 100 had become due and you can settle that using your cash and bank balances. Then when this 200 becomes due, what are the assets you, you have? Only the stock and receivables. Let's say the receivables are getting converted into cash. That's good. So out of 200, you settle 100, but still you have another 100 pending. So what will you do? How will you manage? Because you cannot settle your suppliers with the stock. You purchase stock from them. You cannot pay them in stock. You have to pay them in cash. And you cannot tell them, please come and take back my stock. If you say so, then that becomes the uh, end of the credit business for you. You will not get credit from any suppliers in future because that supplier will take care of the uh, task of negative marketing for you. Okay. So that's why I said this scenario, even though it looks like an ideal scenario, it is not ideal. It's not an ideal scenario because some of the current assets will not come for rescue when you want them very desperately. Okay. Let me take you through scenario three, scenario three. And here the current liabilities are same. 
whereas current assets are comparatively lesser. Look at your current liabilities, it is 300. Look at your current assets, it is 200. So here you can see the problem. You have to settle 300 million within a period of one year and for settling that you have resources of only 200 million with you. You have to settle 300 million but you have only 200 million. So how will you manage that 100 million? That's the question. Okay, that indicates this business is going to land in trouble, number one. Number two, this will also communicate their financial discipline. They've raised 300 million short-term funds. They should have created short-term assets of 300 million, but what they have created is only 200 million. So the question is, what happened to that remaining 100 million? It's very obvious they have diverted it for long-term purpose and they have committed that sin or blunder of diverting the short-term funds for long-term purpose which will put that business into serious trouble okay so if i put that in a form of a graph look the blue bar is the obligation and red bar are the resources and clearly you can see there is a shortage and to that extent this business is in a danger zone because here the resources are lesser than the obligations so when your current assets are lesser than the current liability that is current asset minus current liability obviously your networking capital will be negative you will have negative networking capital okay so let's capture all the three scenarios here scenario one current asset 600 current liability 300 so the networking capital was 600 minus 300 300 networking capital means the long-term funds which were used for creating current assets so here if you see 300 long-term funds and 300 short-term funds put together current assets of 600 was created and if I look at the current ratio it is 300 by 600 it is 2 is to 1 in scenario 2 there is no long-term fund contribution at all and the ratio is 1 is to 1 and in scenario 3 200 is the current asset 300 is the current liability it means there is a negative networking capital negative networking capital indicates a diversion of short-term funds for long-term purpose so whenever you come across a negative networking capital it means there is a diversion of short-term funds for long-term purpose and whenever there is a diversion of short-term funds for long-term purpose the current ratio will also be below one here 200 current asset divided by current liability 300 200 by 300 you are going to get the current ratio as 0.67 is to 1 it means for every 1 rupee obligation they have resources of only 67 paise which clearly shows which clearly shows there is a shortage okay and this also means that there is a diversion of fun at this point I want to ask you a question since uh, some of you or most of you are working in bank what is the minimum current ratio insisted by your bank what is the minimum current ratio insisted by your bank yeah, please type what is the minimum current ratio insisted by your bank i could see answers coming like 1.33 yeah a different set of answers let me just check yeah i could see 1.33 1.171 1.342 is to 1 yes so what we can see is it's a differing bank to bank yes bank to bank this would differ based on their risk appetite within bank itself based on borrower profile whether the borrower is into trading manufacturing services it could vary it could also vary based on the industry okay so that's about the different level of uh, current ratios shall i take a couple of minutes to explain the logic behind a minimum current ratio of 1.33 why banks are insisting on minimum current ratio of 1.33 shall i explain can you all just type bio bio stands for bring it on it is also our internet connectivity check i could see many of you said minimum current ratio is 1.33 so if you're typing bio it means you can hear me you can see the presentation yes thanks a lot thanks a lot and one assurance I will give you, this explanation will open up the logic behind minimum current ratio of 1.33. So whoever working on current ratio and if you didn't know what was the logic of 1.33 or for that matter, whether it is 1.1 or 1.5, this explanation will open up the logic. But once again, I admit it's not a rocket science. 
It's a simple concept. This explanation will beautify your understanding. And with that, you will fall in love with financial analysis. Let's see. Okay. Let's say I have current assets of uh, 100 million and current liabilities of 75 million. And with this information, if I calculate the current ratio, it will be current assets by current liability and it is 100 by 75. So it is 1.33. 100 by 75 and it is 1.33. So what I can infer is when my current ratio is 1.33, it means 75% of the current assets are funded by current liabilities and what is even more important is the remaining 25% of the current assets that is current asset minus current liability the remaining 25% of the current assets are funded by long term funds funded by long term funds we technically call them as net working capital so when the current ratio is 1.33, we can safely conclude that 25% of the current assets are funded by long-term funds. It means there is a 25% long-term fund contribution for creating current assets and that's what most of the banks stipulate as margin for working capital. For example, if you go and check the sanction letter issued by most of the banks, they would have stipulated 25% margin for working capital credit facilities. Even if you look at the Tandon committee recommendation for arriving at working capital, they said that 25% of the current assets have to be funded by margin and it is only the remaining 75% banks can explore funding. Okay, it means there should be a 25 percentage contribution of long term funds for creating current assets and that is verified or that is checked through current ratio. If current ratio is 1.33 then there is 25 percent contribution. If it is greater than 1.33 then there is greater than 25 percent contribution and if it is less than 1.33 then there is less than 25 percent contribution and that's the reason most of the banks insist on current ratio of 1.33 okay yes this is the logic behind minimum current ratio of 1.33 so how many of you find this as bulb on moment bulb on moment means it has opened up the logic for you which you didn't know all these days if it is a bulb on moment, please type bulb on or simply type B O. I take that as your certificate of appreciation for my teaching skills, which I love at most. Yes, thank you. I could see many of you are saying bulb on. It means you are learning in the session. Bulb on indicates there is a learning experience. Good. Thank you. Let's continue. Now let's move on to capital structure ratios under that uh, there are three ratios but uh, here we are going to discuss about what is important from bankers point of view that is debt to equity ratio in debt to equity ratio what we'll be doing is we'll be comparing the debt with equity to understand the long-term solvency of a business let me take you through a balance sheet i'm just going to show you the left hand side that is the equity and liability side look at this shareholder funds are 100 bank loan is 100 debentures are 100 and sundry creators are 200 million it means this business has raised 500 million from four different parties owners 100 million from bankers 100 million from debenture holders by issuing debentures 100 million and from suppliers sundry creators 200 million now what we have to do i mean what we are trying to understand it is debt equity ratio so we have to compare the debt with equity equity is the owner's money in this case it is this 100 and debt is the sum of all the three we call them as outside liabilities and it is 400 so let's compare the debt with equity debt is 400 equity is 100 and the formula for debt equity ratio is debt divided by equity 400 by 100 we get the value as 4. Let me take you through a scenario, a 3 case scenario so that we can understand it better. The first scenario what we are discussing now is total outside liabilities of 400, equity the money contributed by the owners 
as well as the profits that are attributable to them put together we call it as equity 100 so if i calculate the debt equity that is total outside liabilities divided by equity 400 by 100 i get the value as 1 and we express it as 4 is to 1 it means for every 1 rupee contributed by the owner this business has borrowed 4 rupees for every 1 rupee contributed by the owner this business has borrowed 4 rupees so what we can understand if this business is raising 5 rupees 4 out of 5 rupees is by outsiders and 1 out of 5 is contributed by the owners that's what you see here outsider share are 4 out of 5 that is 80 percent and owner share are 1 out of 5 that is 20 percent so what's happening here in this business owner stake is very less whereas outsiders have contributed more and I see this as highly risky proposition because this 80% of the funds which had come into the business would not have come free they would have come with a cost and these costs have to be met let whatever be the situations uh, surrounding the business or affecting the business because they are all fixed cost look at this in this case 400 million they have raised as debt and they have to pay interest they have to pay principal let whatever be the market condition only in rare rare exceptional circumstances the regulators will step in and give direction to the banking system to not to uh, demand for payment for some time like what we have covid reserve bank came and said give them moratorium for three months then give moratorium for another three months okay but it will not happen every year it happens only in rare rare situations so in this case this 400 million they have an obligation and that has a fixed cost in the form of interest in the form of loan principal repayment and they have to be met and if for some or the other reason if their sales comes down and if they are not in a position to meet that commitment meet that obligation this business will get affected to the core because whoever have given money they'll not wait for long they go for legal recourses and that could come as a big blow for the normal operations of this business okay so that's why I say 4 is to 1 is a highly risky scenario let me give you a second scenario where the outside liabilities are 333 and equity is 167 I chose these numbers to convey an important message because look the total funds are 500 here also it is 500 only but I've chosen a different proportion the proportion works like this if you take the debt 333 and if you divide it by equity of 167 you get the debt equity ratio as 2 we express it as 2 is to 1 it means for every 1 rupee contributed by the owners this business is borrowing 2 rupees it means if this business is raising 3 rupees 2 out of 3 that is 2 third that is 67 percent is coming from outsiders and 1 out of 3 that is 33 percent is coming from owners and for me this is much much better than scenario 1 in scenario 1 outsiders contribution are 80 percent where in scenario 2 it is only 67 percent to that extent there will be reduction in fixed cost as well in scenario 1 owners have contributed only 20 percent in scenario 2 owners are contributing 33 percent I see that as a good sign because owners will be investing more of their money when they see their business is more promising let me take you through scenario 3 where total outside liabilities are 250 and equity is 250 again I have maintained the total as 500 but I have changed the proportion so what is the debt equity ratio now 250 by 250 it is 1 is to 1 it means if this business is raising 2 rupees 1 out of 2 that is 50 percent share is coming from outsiders and 1 out of 2 50 percent share is coming from owners and this is much much better than the first and the second scenario because here the outsiders share have come down and as a result the fixed cost related to that will also come down fixed commitment fixed obligation will come down this will reduce the burden it will reduce the pressure on the business and owners are investing 50 percent it means they know this business is very much promising that's why they are committing their money so what is an indication the indication is scenario one attracts high financial risk scenario two we say ideal and scenario three is the best the best okay so this ratio that is debt equity ratio or we call it as TOL total outside liability by T and W that's basically the equity 
okay that communicates the long term solvency businesses with a high risk sorry businesses with high level of ratio will have a high financial risk and because of that it's possible that during recessionary market conditions those businesses may not be able to withstand they'll get washed away because when their sales comes down and if their fixed cost is going to remain fixed only it means the impact is reduced sale higher fixed cost so the profit will turn out to be loss and that business will have its natural death okay so that's what we are trying to understand through this debt equity ratio so whoever working in bank you will know because you will be carrying out credit rating of the customers and uh, in my experience the highest weightage is given for the single ratio that is debt equity or we call it as total outside liability by tangible net worth yeah that's about debt equity ratio and here when i say debt equity ratio i mean this tol by tnw that is total outside liability by tangible net worth the reason why i'm giving this explanation is because some banks will use the term debt equity some banks will use tol by tnw and in some banks there will be a combination they'll use tol by tnw for evaluating the business as a whole and they'll be using debt equity ratio only with reference to term loan okay for term loan they will compute debt equity ratio so here my explanation of debt equity ratio is tol by tnw now a question to all of you what is the maximum tol by tnw ratio acceptable by your bank tolerable bank tolerable by your bank maximum means your bank will not go beyond that okay i could see like 4 is to 1 4 means 80% can be the overall debt or liabilities it means 20% should come from owners i could see sridatha saying 5 is to 1 then 2 is to 1 is coming 2 is to 1 means what 2/3 67% can be outside liabilities it means 33% should come from owners so here also what we could see is bank to bank this could vary based on the risk appetite and within the bank also based on the borrower profile whether the borrower is into trading manufacturing services and depending upon industry also it could vary so the message is we cannot have a one size or one ratio fit all approach because it's going to vary based on the profile based on the bank risk appetite so what you have to do when it comes to practical application of this ratio the message or the advice is please be guided by loan policy guidelines of your bank because loan policy guidelines of your bank is your charter and that will tell you how you should handle that scenario here i have explained the ratios i have explained what they mean how you have to interpret it but to what extent you should go or what you should insist as minimum that should be ruled or governed by loan policy guidelines of your bank and if that makes sense for you please type ms please type ms Next, we'll move on to coverage ratio. In that, first, I'm going to explain debt service coverage ratio. We call it as DSCR. This ratio is calculated to measure the repayment capacity of a borrower when he approaches a bank for a term loan. So, how repayment capacity is measured? It is measured by finding out the cash profit available for debt service and comparing that with the repayment obligation for every year, which is interest plus principal. so here how this cash profit available for debt service is computed let me show what we do is we take profit after tax and dividend with that depreciation will be added back reason being depreciation is a non cash item not even a single penny cash goes out in the name of depreciation okay since we want to find out cash profit what we do we add back depreciation because while arriving at the profit after tax this depreciation was subtracted as an expense but no cash goes out so we are adding back depreciation then we are also adding interest not because it is a non cash item but because we want to know what is the cash profit available for paying interest and principal If you want to know what is the cash profit available for paying interest and principal you cannot take cash profit which is after paying interest okay because we are starting with profit after tax and dividend right this profit after tax was arrived after subtracting all expenses which also include interest so let us add back that so that it gets nullified so by doing this taking profit after tax and dividend and by adding depreciation and interest we arrive at 
cash profit and this is the formula followed by most of the bankers let me take you through an example so that you can understand it better uh, look at this statement this particular business has made a sales of 1000 their direct cost is 500 their gross profit is 500 operating expenses are 100 depreciation is 100 interest on loan is 100 so from sales direct cost was deducted 500 they had a gross profit of 500 and we are deducting three expenses so from gross profit when we deduct all the three expenses we get the profit before tax so 500 minus 300 you have as 200 from that let's deduct tax at 50 percent which is 100 so you get profit after tax of 100 now listen for computing debt service coverage ratio what we have to do we have to take profit after tax with that we have to add back depreciation and interest on loan in this case there is no dividend so we are starting with profit after tax so 100 plus 100 plus 100 300 this becomes the cash profit this cash profit have to be compared with the repayment obligation which is basically interest on loan of 100 what we have seen plus interest on principal I am giving you which is 100 so what is the total obligation 200 what is the cash profit 300 now we can find out debt service coverage ratio DSCR is equal to profit after tax and dividend plus interest on term loan plus depreciation divided by interest plus principal in this case it is 300 divided by 200 and you get as 1.5 times you get the value as what 1.5 times and what does that communicate for every one rupee loan obligation which is interest plus principal this business is having a cash profit of 1 rupee 50 paise so it looks good right because for paying 1 rupee they are having a cash profit of 1 rupee 50 paise it means from 1 rupee 50 paise 1 rupee can be paid off still 50 paise is available with that business they can use that 50 paise for supporting their working capital requirements okay right now I want to ask you a question what is the minimum DSCR insisted by most of the banks if you are working in a bank or if you are exposed to this concept please give your answer what is the minimum DSCR insisted by most of the banks yes I could see answers coming like 1 1.5 1.33 1 also there so with boost 1 1.5 1.25 anyone working in public sector bank because they are mostly you will see like 1.75 right anyone with 1.75 ratio rupinder singh 0.8 i doubt 0.8 means you are saying 80 rupees is sufficient for paying 100 rupees i doubt that yeah deepak bank of india 1.5 okay right okay fine 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 let's let's continue okay 1.1 will be insisted by the banks who are ready to take risk okay because 1.1 is a very small ratio uh, if they are okay with that it means they are willing to take more risk it means the side effect is the uh, interest rate will be very high 1.5 is accepted by most of the bankers and 1.75 is insisted by uh, public sector banks okay who are very conservative uh, they'll be insisting a DSCR of 1.75 now uh, let me take couple of minutes to explain the DSCR rational uh, why uh, some banks are insisting on 1.75 times or, or say for that matter even 1.5 times why banks are insisting on DSCR of uh, uh, 1.5 or 1.75 and not just one because uh, if DSCR is one for paying uh, loan obligation of one they are having resources of one why not bank stop with that why they are insisting on 1.5 or 1.75 shall I explain yeah can you all just type BIO once again it stands for bring it on it is also our internet connectivity check and this will be something you will really enjoy and cherish because many of you had bulb on moment in current ratio right it will be even more brighter in this let's see okay let me explain the rational behind this minimum DSCR look at this if DSCR is 1.75 is to 1 it means for every 1 rupee obligation there is a cash profit of 1 rupee 75 paise 
so from 1 rupee 75 paise 1 rupee can be paid and what is left with the business is this 75 paise this 75 paise is the profit after tax after dividend after paying interest and after paying principal also so it basically goes as a retained profit and this retained profit will go to a head called reserves and surplus in balance sheet under the head equity and equity along with other long-term liabilities will become long-term funds and that long-term funds can be used for supporting working capital margin if this does not make sense for you worry not look at this your statement of profit and loss only communicates what is profit from that we calculate cash profit then we compare that with the obligation and we arrive at DSCR and if DSCR is 1.75 it means out of 1.75 1 can be paid 0.75 can be retained in the business and I told you that this retained profit will go to balance sheet under the head reserves and surplus so now this reserves and surplus along with capital will be called as equity and this equity along with the long-term liabilities will be called as long-term funds these long-term funds can be considered or can be used for creating long-term assets I repeat these long-term liabilities can be used for creating long-term assets but if you look at the proportion look you have so much of long-term funds but only a portion of long-term funds has been used for creating long-term assets it means there is some surplus so what's going to happen here this business is also raising some short-term funds it is creating short-term assets the short-term assets are more than the short-term funds how it was made possible because short-term funds are very small but short-term assets are much bigger than that it was made possible because the remaining surplus of long-term funds the remaining surplus of long-term funds has been utilized for creating this short-term assets now try to link with with our fund utilization principle we said a portion of current asset should be funded by short-term funds and another portion should be funded by long-term funds because I said I marked it as ideal utilizing the long-term funds for creating short-term assets is ideal because that is going to relieve the business from liquidity pressure so if a business is having a DSCR of 1.75 that 0.75 gets retained in the business it gets retained it becomes part of long-term funds so that long-term funds after being utilized for creating long-term assets there will be some surplus that surplus will in turn get utilized for short-term assets and this is what we call a as long-term funds used for creating short-term assets technically this is the networking capital okay so it is not that mere profit profit along with capital along with long-term liability they all become put together long-term funds and they are actually supporting short-term asset creation so this is the logic I hope you would have understood yes this is the logic behind DSCR of 1.75 this is the logic why banks are very particular about the level like 1.75 let it be 1.75 or 1.5 or 1.1 and if you got that logic clear with this explanation please type bulb on or simply type bo you can also type bulb on if you are deriving value from the session if you have learned something critical meaningful sensible something important for your job something important for your career please type bulb on i'll take that as your certificate of appreciation and thank you Thanks a lot. What you have seen now is only the tip of the iceberg. What you have seen now is only the tip of the iceberg. But the best part is you have understood whatever I have explained so far. Thank you very much. The reason why I say it's a tip of the iceberg is because in reality, when you do the credit appraisal, when you do the financial analysis, you have to read balance sheet line by line you should focus or put your attention on every item in balance sheet. You have to analyze various set of financial ratios. There will be liquidity, solvency, profitability, return on investment ratios, various set of ratios. Then you have to study the cash flow statements in depth. You have to focus on item by item items. You should see where they generated money, where they have used, how they have used. Then you should also study their fund flow statement in depth and again in between the lines to identify whether any fund diversion have taken place. Then you should develop special skill for assessing the working capital requirement of the borrower. 
here you got to empathize with the borrower but at the same time you should also protect the bank's interest next you should be able to put up a comprehensive loan proposal if a borrower comes for a term loan for putting up a project because this requires viability study you have to look into their repayment capacity dscr fire break even sensitivity and so on next you should also be able to work seamlessly on cma report the basic excel document which captures the past financial data as well as the current estimate and projection and from this only all kind of analysis will happen next you should be able to arrive at credit risk rating for the borrower you should be able to come across different types of business entities business models profile and you should also be able to understand the forex impact on import export transactions so what all this means all this means you got to learn more right so how many of you are really ready to learn more because once again i reiterate what i have showed you today is only tip of the iceberg so how many of you are interested in learning more if you are really interested in learning more if you want to take this journey to the next level if you want to improve your skills that is required for your job and that's the fundamental for your banking career then type i l m i l m stands for i am interested in learning more i l m stands for i am interested in learning more whoever interested please type i l m thank you very much can i have your permission to introduce the courses which i have published for bankers which will solve all the problems we discussed if you are permitting me just type yes just type yes i'll take that as your approval financial and credit analysis mastery bundle it's a bundle of course i have created for financial and credit analysis purposes to start with we have course number 1 our best seller course banking credit analysis process by taking this course you will get a complete picture of banking credit analysis process starting with credit analysis financial analysis ratios cash flows fund flows working capital term loan and so on it's basically 30 plus sections 200 plus lectures this is one of our best selling course and it's included in this package then comes course number 2 how to carry out financial analysis as a banker this course focuses exclusively on financial analysis covering how to carry out financial analysis through ratios fund flows and cash flows then we have course number 3 how to carry out term loan appraisal and analysis as a banker this is a course which is going to take you through the technical process of term loan appraisal and assessment because here you have to understand the techno economic viability of the project you should arrive at the cost of project means of finance that requires a different set of approach you should understand the production factors of a project you should understand the technical analysis involved in term loan appraisal and assessment and this course will take you through that then we have course number 4 how to prepare cma report for bank loan cma report is basically that excel spreadsheet which is going to capture the past financials present estimate and future projections and it's by looking at the indicators generated out of the cma report bankers are going to take critical critical decision so in this course through eight sections i have covered the cma report preparation process in depth with an elaborate comprehensive case study then we have course number 5 how to read balance sheet in this course i have picked up a real life balance sheet from stock exchange and i have explained in and out of balance sheet reading process by taking this course you will develop confidence in reading balance sheet then comes course number 6 how to read civil report by taking this course you will develop the ability to read the civil report read in between the lines as well as read each and every line of civil report and frame the credit opinion of the borrower then comes course number 7 how to prepare cash budget for bank loans this course will help you when a borrower approaches you for short term loans ad hoc loans or for letter of credit so by taking this course you will get the complete picture of cash budget with exposure to the format and solving real case studies so 
it's basically seven courses which I have introduced and this seven course package is what I call as financial and credit analysis mastery bundle and the price of this seven courses works out to somewhere close to 13,000 but I'm going to give it at a discounted price for you today because you have attended this webinar and the offer price what I give you is 4,990 rupees okay but I'm not going to just stop with this I'm going to give you more I'm going to give you a lot more I'm going to give you lots and lots of bonus you are going to get course number eight registration and licenses required to run business in India it will take you through that entire process course number nine how to carry out credit risk rating for non trading entities course number 10 here you will learn banking credit analysis in depth once again through various case studies so how many courses now it's 10 courses of value close to 19,000 rupees but you are not going to pay that amount it's same 4,990 it means you get these three courses as bonus but it is not just this I'm going to give you some more bonus course number 11 financial statement analysis a complete study course 12 master class on working capital management course 13 accounting and finance for bankers course 14 NPM management a complete study so how many courses it's 14 courses of value close to 27,000 but I am going to give it to you at the same price of 4,990 not yet over some more bonus here comes course number 15 where you will learn business finance secrets so you will be wearing the hats of the entrepreneur so that you can understand the business finance secret process then comes the next course finance for non-finance executives this will be your savior if you are from non-finance background then we have the next course basics of forex management a complete study this will save you if you're going to deal with import export customers so how many courses now it's 17 courses of value close to 33,000 but I am offering it to you at the same price of 4,990 not yet over some more bonus here comes course number 18 for you which is legal and regulatory aspects of banking part 1 and part 2 and I'm also going to give you a course on accounting basics in 66 minutes and a course on fair practices code on lenders liability so how many courses now it's 21 courses of value close to 37,000 but I'm going to give it to you at the same price of 4,990 it means you get all these free you get all these as bonus but bonus not yet over some more you have the next course that is basic elements related to bank loan proposal this course will teach you how to write bank loan proposal then there is a course on credit policy products delivery appraisal risk and rating then you get access to the course called export finance priority sector lending and retail loan and you also get access to the course collateral securities a comprehensive study so how many courses it's basically 25 courses of which the seven courses are main courses and I'm giving you bonus all the remaining courses comes to you as bonus because you have attended this webinar so what is the overall value the overall value is close to 45,000 of 25 courses it's 3200 plus lectures you are going to get lifetime access to all these pre-recorded courses you can access them in your mobile app in desktop and the price is close to 45,000 but you are going to get it for same 4,990 and it is not yet over something more I'm going to give you access to ebooks ebooks on current ratio debt equity ratio cash flow statement capital structuring financial break-even capital budgeting so it's basically 12 ebooks you are going to get access and I'm also going to give you access to certain e-resources you will get access to project report template CMA template you will also get access to a template which you can use for planning your child's future education and you will also get audiobook on types of financing you will also get access to test series related to analysis of financial statements working capital requirements and ratio analysis and something more you will also get access to career guidance material which is related to professional courses for banking executives and a material on all about certified credit professional so 
It's basically 25 courses of value close to 45,000, 3,200 plus lectures, 20 ebooks and resources of value close to 2,000 rupees. You get lifetime access for this pre recorded courses and e resources. You can access them in mobile app, desktop, laptop. Its value is close to 47,000, but you are going to get it today for 4,991. This is a one-time opportunity for you. Make use of this opportunity. Enroll now. So thanks for this opportunity. I'm going to share the link. Please check your chat section. Whoever watching this in Zoom, check your chat section. Whoever watching this in YouTube, check the chat section as well as description below. I'm placing the link now and this link is valid only for next 20 minutes. So if you want to continue your learning journey, if you want to take it to the next level, if you want to make best use of this opportunity, your time is on now. It's going to be next 20 minutes. So if you believe that this webinar has added value for you, and if you want to continue your learning journey, now the ball is in your court. Please click on the link. It will take you to the course. If you already have a student account in CA Raja classes, directly you can enroll. Otherwise, it will prompt you to open up a student account and then you can complete the enrollment registration process. Let me also share some of the feedback given by our earlier students. Just have a look at it. If you still wonder whether you should enroll in this package or not, just look back your past 60 plus minutes you have spent. Just try to answer all the four questions. Question one, did you really understood what was explained? If answer is yes, whether you are able to relate with the things that were explained in this webinar, if answer is yes, if you derived value in the 60 plus minutes and if answer is yes, and if you had that aha moment or bulb on moment that you have learned something really meaningful, useful, then I would suggest go and enroll confidently because you will get that throughout this package, throughout the courses. That's the assurance from my side. If you have this question as to how you can access these courses, just have a look at the screen. If you enroll now, you can access them in desktop, laptop, by visiting our portal. You can also install our app. We have app for Android phone users as well as iPhone users. You can download the app from Play Store, App Store, just search for CA Raja classes. And the courses, whatever you enroll will be available in the app also. And the best part is you can download the courses into your mobile within the app and you can access them later even without internet connection. After enrolling the course, if you have some doubts or if you need some guidance, we are going to provide you 24 by 7 lifetime support through our Telegram community. We have a community for financial analysis where 1000 plus bankers have already signed up. This is only for paid students who are coming to this specific course. You can ask all your questions and you will get reply. You can also learn from question answers of other participants. I'm also sharing the screenshot of our Telegram community. This is where uh, most effective learning happens because on a daily basis, there will be discussions, Q and A's, and many uh, take advantage of this, okay? And now it's time for you to take your call. And before you take that final call, let me give you a bold assurance. Let me give you a bold assurance. My bold assurance is, this package will give you at least 100 times value for the money you are going to commit. That's my assurance. You will get at least 100 times value for the money you are going to commit in this course because that's the kind of feedback I have from earlier students. That's the kind of upskilling happened for our earlier students. 
Many of them have come back to me saying that they got their promotions, cleared their credit examinations. They were able to do their credit related job with utmost confidence. So it's because of such a feedback, I'm giving you a high level of assurance. And for you, this is not an expense, rather a one-time investment. And what you are going to get is lifetime access to the courses. And I'm giving you a lifetime Q&A support through our Telegram community. You will not find such an opportunity elsewhere or anywhere in the market. So I'm saying it very boldly and I can give you that assurance. So whoever enrolling now, please type I am enrolling. Please type I am enrolling or simply type I am E. I am E, it means you are enrolling now. Upon completion of enrollment, please share the payment proof to this WhatsApp number or to this email. You will also get invoice and email confirmation. I'll just show you the process. I'll just show you the process, how you can access these enrolled courses. Uh, before that, whether all of you are with me, just type with you, because it's basically an internet connectivity check. Now and then I get that electric shock, internet connection boof. Okay, all of you are with me, good, great. So let me just take you through. The process is like this. You can access the courses through desktop, laptop, through browser. Go to browser or go to Google types courses.caerajaclasses.com. Caerajaclasses.com is our website. Courses.caerajaclasses.com is our e-learning portal. Okay. So all the courses are listed here only. Courses.caerajaclasses.com. So click on that link. It will open up. On the top right, you will see login button. Okay. Once you open on the top right, you will see login button. So once you click that login button, a box like this will open where you have to give your user ID and password. Yeah, Mridu, yes, I will, I will look into, okay? See, once you click that login button, there will be a sign up or login button. If you click that, it will open up this box and it will have email and password. See, your user ID is nothing but the email with which you have registered in our portal. Many students, they get into confusion. Uh, sir, what is my user ID? I forgot. What is my password? I forgot. For you, answer is our first ever mail from CA Raja classes to you is your user ID and password. I repeat, our first ever mail. So how do you find that first ever mail? So I don't know when I signed up. All these questions arises. For that answer is very simple. Go and open your email. There will be a search bar on the top right. In that, just type CA Raja classes at CA Raja classes .org. That is our official email. Okay. CA Raja classes at CA Raja classes .org. And if you click search, it will list out all the mails we have sent. In that, you go back, you go back to our first ever mail. First ever mail is welcome mail. That will have your user ID and password sent by our system, sent by our system. And in that you will have this, okay? Is that clear? Just type clear so that I can proceed further because I'm saying all this such that you do not face any uh, difficulties later in accessing the course. Okay, perfect, right. Now give your user ID, password, login. 
Once you log in, you will see a page something like this. On the top, you will see my courses. Can you see that? My courses. Click that my courses, simple, that will show the course what you have enrolled today. It will show whatever courses you have enrolled today, including the course you have enrolled today. And if you click on the course you have enrolled today, that will list out all the 25 courses included in the bundle, all the 12 ebooks, all the eight e resources. And if you click on any of the course, it will open. On the left hand side, you will see the lecture titles. On the right hand side, you will see the screen, video screen. So click on the lecture title, right hand side, it will play. You can make it full screen. Once you are done with one lecture, by clicking next, you can move on to the next lecture. So this is the procedure. It is as simple, as simple as YouTube. Okay. Only thing is, it's a secured one. You have to give your user ID and password. Yeah. Uh, just give me a moment. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Abhishek, yes, I have seen your payment. I will give you acknowledgement uh, to you personally. Okay. Yeah. So this is the procedure for accessing the courses through desktop. We also have mobile learning app, both Android phone users, iPhone users. Android phone users, you have to go to Play Store. iPhone users, you have to go to App Store. Okay, go to Play Store, App Store. Search for CA Raja classes. Search for CA Raja classes and you will find them here. Yeah, this is our app. Click and install the app. Click and install the app. It will ask for some basic uh, confirmation like any other applications. So click login. See here the beauty of the app and desktop access is both are integrated. So you can access something in the desktop laptop and you can continue accessing them in the app also. It means both are integrated. For both, you can use the same user ID and password. Okay, right. So give the necessary permissions. You have to give your user ID, password, login. And you will see something like this, not exactly the same screen, but something like this. And on the top, you will see this three bar, right? Okay, you have to touch that. You have to touch that bar. And that will open up a pane like this. And in that you have to touch this my courses. Touch this my courses. So that will show all the courses you have enrolled, including the course what you have enrolled today. That's the procedure. And if you touch that, it will list out all the courses included in the package. Fine. So you can click on the course, you can start playing. And the best thing is, see here, you can see this one, this button. It's for download. So if you want to download this video, you can download. But downloaded content will be available within the app only. But even without internet connection, later on, you can access this. So whatever videos which you consider as very critical, you can download. Or if you want to download the entire course, you can go and download. But it will consume your overall memory. So in that way, you can in that way you have to plan for it yeah jitan right don't worry don't worry i think you have some problem in resetting the password don't worry i will do it for you i have seen your whatsapp message also i will help you out okay so this is the procedure for accessing in desktop laptop as well as mobile app both android and iphone users so far is it clear for all of you if it is clear please type clear then i will go with our bonus material Perfect. Thank you so much. Here comes the bonus material. Why I call it as bonus material? Because it's available only for creamy layer. And you are so special because you have that burning desire to learn, to upskill yourself, to grow up in your hierarchy. And you, you should also be growing in monetary terms. So for that, some foundational things you have to do how to increase your salary or business income. This is something I read in a powerful book and I converted that as a lecture. I am going to share it with you. It's for next seven minutes. And with that, we'll come to the end of this webinar. Yeah, let's continue.
it's midnight 1 am when i read this i thought immediately i should convert this as a lecture for our youtube subscribers how to increase your salary or business income salary increment this will be the wish of every employee but many of them think that this salary increment is decided either by the economic environment or it is decided by superiors but the fact is it is decided by what we do or what we don't do our position that is in what stage we are how we are was actually chosen by us if you are not satisfied with your current salary if you are not satisfied with your current income in your business then you have to ask your boss you have to ask your boss for that you should stand in front of a mirror and negotiate with your boss the person you see in mirror is your boss this person only decides your salary it means you only decide your salary you only decide your business income if your present income is not increasing beyond a certain level it means you touched your highest level of income for the present skill and present knowledge you have that means you have reached your maximum so if you want to earn more then you got to acquire new skills you got to acquire new knowledge so that others will be willing to pay you more and one good thing is you can become what you wish but that requires some efforts efforts are basically you have to read more you have to upskill yourself you have to engage in continuous practice continuous learning and you have to continuously focus on progress in this book author talks about a research conducted by a professor of chicago university in that what they have found is 80% of people register only 3% annual increase in income whereas 20% of people recorded 11% annual increase in income so whoever coming under this 80% they had only 3% annual increase in income and they never progressed they always worried about money they had shortage of money at the time of their retirement and they never learned anything new since their first job they never read anything new they never learned any new skill they didn't bother to upskill themselves they were doing same or routine job again and again and people around them also never read anything new they had no improvement and because of this they believed that others are also living in the same way they believe the lifestyle of others is also similar like this so that's about 80% people whereas remaining 20% people they had 11% annual increase in income how all of them were lifelong learners they read something about business they always read something about self development they participated in seminars workshops to improve their skills they networked with like minded people they discussed which makes them better they discussed about ideas and insights which will help them to achieve results at a faster pace so if you want to achieve higher income whether it be in the form of increment in salary or increase of income in your business you have to become a lifelong learner so how to become lifelong learner author prescribes three steps to become lifelong learner he is suggesting three steps and these steps will bring total change in the way you attract higher income at a pace greater than you think what are those three steps let's see one by one step number 1 you have to read you have to read daily at least one hour every day something related to your field you have to spend at least one hour every day in reading matters related to your field it can be related to your job it can be related to your business and when you do this please keep away newspapers magazines tvs computers put your entire focus on reading 
anything that helps in improving your job improving your business keep this make it as a daily routine if you do this at least one hour per day you will be able to read one book at least per week it means in a year you will be able to complete 50 books if you want to get phd in a top university you have to read and research 30 to 50 books but by reading one hour per day what you're going to get is new ideas and by planning how to implement those ideas in your job in your business you will get results and that is something equivalent that is your reading becomes equivalent to a phd so that's step one what is step two you have to listen you have to listen to audio books you have to listen to audio lectures nowadays we can also include online courses you have to listen to them at least when you travel that is when when you don't drive when you are traveling make use of your smartphone and listen to them on an average 500 to 1000 hours of businessmen or working executives are spent on travel that's equal to 12 to 24 working weeks or that can be equated with one semester in a university so make best use of this time to listen to audiobooks lectures online courses related to your job related to your business step number 3 go back to learning whenever you get training whether it is your internal training or external training attend and learn and if required you you should even pay and learn more if you have decided what level you should achieve then you have to find out what and all you should learn so that you can achieve that targeted level and you should master time management you should master negotiation skills discussion and conversations you should achieve expertise in goal setting finding solution for problems strategic planning and you got to acquire new skills that could lead to faster growth so these three steps are very critical if you want to become a lifelong learner and only those who become lifelong learner will be able to increase their salary or business income i've read this in a book called personal success yeah i read this in a book called personal success personal success uh, even if you look around people who are successful in your own organization they are the people who have implemented uh, these kind of strategies these kind of steps okay so how many of you find this useful find this useful it has helped you to uh, get some insights if you find this useful please type useful so if you find this really useful please type useful i try to implement this on a daily basis and i could see the power it's it's a transformation effect okay so see all of you would have received a mail okay uh, you would have received two mail mail number one is invoice mail number two is the confirmation that you have enrolled in this course how you can access through desktop laptop through app it will also have the link for telegram and on the top of it it has something known as banking premium membership okay it has something known as banking premium membership uh, that is something which will make you a lifelong learner and uh, i wish to share that to you through whatsapp only okay right so just go through the mail you will be getting a whatsapp message with a small video that will just explain about our banking premium membership and whoever interested can go for it and i'm uh, giving my whatsapp link okay so whoever have enrolled today whoever have enrolled today uh, please use this link and just i mean if you're uh, watching this in your mobile okay click this link it will take you to whatsapp just send that message it means it will automatically generate a message enrolled mastery bundle yes i got message from dhananjay bande like that all of you whoever have enrolled today so i mean it's a easy way for me because uh, you communicate to me so automatically i will save all your details and in turn i will share you my acknowledgement in whatsapp once again and also about banking premium membership just go through banking premium membership if you want to be really a lifelong learner it will help you in a significant way that is request number one and whoever have enrolled today you'll be getting access to the telegram by now you would have got because it's automatic mail 
you should have received that okay so two things connect with me through whatsapp and for any clarification guidance you can connect with me through this email okay okay fine and uh, so more or less we are done and if you really derived value in today's session you can uh, type idv and with that note you can sign off thank you all